So you've probably heard that index funds are one of the best ways to invest your money, especially if you want to invest your money in a completely passive and set and forget type of way. Warren Buffett, the world's most famous investor, has repeatedly spoken very highly of index fund investing, saying that it's the best way to invest for most people. And he's even said that he's put into his own will that when he dies, he would like the portion of his estate money that's not being given to charity to be put into index funds in order for his widowed wife to be looked after. So that's a pretty strong vote of confidence for index funds coming from the world's best investor. And now I'll explain what they are and what's so great about them, starting with an overview and then we're gonna get more detail because there's a few things to unravel here. There are actively managed funds and then there are passive index funds. Those are the two types of funds. Actively managed funds are run by a fund manager or a fund management team. And these actively managed funds are attempting to beat the stock market benchmark by picking stocks that they think will perform best and not including the stocks that they produce predict won't do very well. Ultimately, most of these actively managed funds end up being fairly active with all of their buying and their selling. And again, all this activity is in the pursuit of achieving the best results possible. And even more specifically, they're attempting to achieve better results than the stock market benchmark. Passive index funds, on the other hand, are the benchmark. These funds simply replicate the stock market benchmark by making no attempt to pick the winners. And instead, they simply own and purchase all of the stocks that make up the benchmark. And in the correct proportion, of the benchmark index. Let me explain further. So the most popular stock market benchmark and the one that all of the actively managed funds are attempting to outperform is called the S&P 500 index. But here's the thing, it's kind of embarrassing. The actively managed funds of the world don't actually end up outperforming the S&P 500 index benchmark. Just take a look at this graphic. This data is as of June 2020, and it shows the percentage of actively managed funds that did not beat their benchmark index. So for the United States, which uses the S&P 500 index as their benchmark, we can see that over a five year period, almost 80% of actively managed funds failed to beat the benchmark. In Canada, that number is 97%. Ouch. So obviously we can see that there's a tendency for actively managed funds to underperform compared to their benchmark. There's more than one reason for this, but the main reason is the high expense ratios that come along with these actively managed funds. And the term expense ratio, by the way, is just another name for the management fees. These fees are typically one, two, or 3% annually. And the funny thing is that this is roughly the amount by which these actively managed funds end up underperforming the S&P 500 index benchmark by why? Essentially what's happened here is these passive index funds have come along and really just shine the light on the fact that this entire profession of active managers are getting paid for practically nothing. And this is ultimately why Warren Buffett recommends passive index funds for most people. And by the way, let's quickly discuss the actively managed funds that do outperform the S&P 500 index benchmark. What this report here called the persistent scorecard report has done is they've taken all the actively managed funds, ranked them by performance over various periods of time and then look to see whether they were able to sustain their overperformance in the next following period. What they found was that the funds in the top half of that ranking over a five year period were not likely to remain in the top half in the following five year period. According to the report, it was more likely for a top half fund to close its doors or change its style, 41.5% combined, than repeat its performance. Now this report here is essentially trying to say that an active manager's performance is purely based on luck and not skill and is not likely to be sustained over any significant period of time. And now while I do not believe in or accept this idea that the only way to beat the market is from luck and nor would Warren Buffett or any other value investor believe in or accept this idea that outperformance of the market is based completely on luck. That's a whole other subject though, by the way, about whether stock prices are efficient or based on emotion. And I talk about that in this video here linked in the corner and linked in the description below. But we're also going to circle back to it in this video you're watching right now because it's important to cover this before I introduce you to my favorite index fund later in this video. Nonetheless, in spite of me not agreeing with the overall premise of this report that I just showed you, it still does a good job of showing us that picking an actively managed fund or fund manager based on their past results isn't easy. Joel Greenblatt, another great investor and who was similar to Warren Buffett, a student of Benjamin Graham, has commented in the past that picking a fund manager might be even more difficult than just picking the stocks yourself. All right, the most popular index is the S&P 500 index, which is short for the Standard & Poor's 500 index. And so an S&P 500 index fund would therefore own all of the 500 stocks that make up the S&P 500 index. The S&P 500 index was created 
created and established by a company called Standard & Poor's Global, which is a fund rating agency that's been around forever. And this one just kind of caught on and everyone started using it as the benchmark to compare their investment performance against. At one time, the Dow 30 index was the benchmark that most people used to compare their performance results against, but eventually the S&P 500 became the more popular benchmark to use. It is a good benchmark because it's made up of the 500 largest companies in the United States, and it represents more than 83% of the total US stock market value. There's a number of S&P 500 index funds that match their holdings to this index. Here's a list of some of them sorted by total assets under management. So all of these funds listed here are what's called exchange traded funds, which are also known as ETFs. And all of these funds strictly just copy the holdings of the S&P 500 index. When we change the view to see the expense ratio they each have, we can see that they all have an expense ratio of 0.03%, except for the SPY, which has an expense ratio of 0.09%. So all of these funds do the exact same thing thing. They're just run by different investment management companies. This fund is run by iShares by BlackRock. This one is run by Vanguard. And these two are run by an investment management company called State Street Investment Managers. The difference between the SPY and these other three funds here are that these three funds are newer and were created and structured in such a way that allows for the shares held within it to be lent out, which ends up creating some additional interest income. And the newer structure also allows for dividends to be reinvested. The SPY is kind of one of the original index funds that was created a long time ago, and it lacks these structural advantages that these new index funds have. And that's also why the expense ratio is slightly higher on the SPY fund. If you were going to invest in any one of these for the long term, it would be wise to choose one of the three with the lower expense ratio rather than the SPY. The reason why the SPY is still popular in spite of having a little bit of a higher expense ratio is that the daily volume of shares being traded back and forth of the SPY is massive. And so it's what's used by many traders, day traders, swing traders, that sort of thing. All right, so the S&P 500 is not the only index. There's actually tons of them. Other popular ones are the NASDAQ 100, the Dow 30, and the Russell 3000. These are just their names, and their names really aren't that important. I just want to illustrate the point that there's a bunch of these indexes, and business news channels like CNBC will flash them in front of you, and people like to look at them to get a gauge of how the overall stock market is doing. Each index's criteria of which stocks will be included within the index has been decided upon by someone or some committee. But just look at this massive list of indexes. I won't scroll through the whole thing because it's just so long. However, I felt I should show it to you just so you had an idea of how many indexes there are. Most of them are, in my opinion, kind of dumb and pointless. And most of them don't even have a corresponding fund that tracks them to allow you to invest in the index anyways. And not that you'd even want to. When Warren Buffett talks about investing in index funds, he's referring to the broad market index funds like the S&P 500, not these weird obscure ones. When when you invest in a broad market index like the S&P 500, you're essentially saying that you believe the United States economy will continue to grow and prosper over time, and that you want to own a piece of it so that you can participate in that growth and prosperity. And at the same time, you're ultimately saying that you don't have the time or the inclination to pick individual stocks and you'd rather just own a small amount of all the stocks that make up the index and take a passive set and forget type of approach. So all that is to say it would be silly and it would be missing the point if you were to go and buy a small cap financials index or an index for companies in the business of flying or an index for companies that have some sort of involvement with 5G technology. Picking and choosing various exchange traded funds and trading in and out of them would be completely missing the point. If you were to go out there and buy a bunch of obscure ETFs like this, for one, you'd be paying unnecessarily high expense ratio fees. And besides that, the whole thing would quickly stop resembling investing and quickly just become no different than speculation or gambling. And again, you'd just be missing out on the whole point of Warren Buffett's advice. Warren Buffett's advice is to buy broad market index funds and do so consistently over time and with a consistent amount of money and continuing to do so through thick and thin. And this is the advice he gives because it's what will be best for most people. On that note, the part about doing it consistently over time and with a consistent and amount is a piece of that strategy that cannot be neglected. The reason to do it this way and spreading it out over time is because buying large lump sums at any one time could mean buying at not ideal times. If you buy your broad market index funds on a regular basis, like once a month, for example, and of a consistent amount, say 10% of your income, then yes, sometimes you'll be buying at not the most ideal time. However, you'll also be sometimes buying at very ideal times as well. So the idea is that in the long run, they cancel each other out and 
and this whole market timing thing becomes a non-issue. So again, just stick with it through thick and thin. If you bail out because the stock market crashes and you get scared, you'd again be completely missing the point. It will be tempting to try to time the market and avoid the bad days and only participate in the good days, but it's not possible. If you wanna learn more about this subject of market timing, then you should check out this video right here. I'll link it up in the corner and I'll link it in the description as well. The main thing to remember to stay level-headed is that owning shares of stock means that you own a percentage of the underlying business. And just because the quoted price has gone down does not mean the value of that business has gone down. By the way, if you know anyone that needs to hear this, please hit the share button below, copy that link and send it directly to your friend via text or email. And that way they can benefit from this video too. And if you can't think of anyone to share with, no problem, at least hit the thumbs up button though. That does definitely help out as well. Okay, so now check this out. Most indexes, including the S&P 500 that we've been talking about are what's called market cap weighted indexes. And what this means is that not all 500 stocks that make up this index are held equally within it. Interesting. So for example, take a look at the holdings of the Vanguard S&P 500 index fund that we looked at earlier. 6.68% of the money that makes up this fund is invested in the company Apple. And that's because Apple has the highest market cap of all the public companies right now. And this index is weighted by market cap. And therefore with this index and any other market cap weighted index, the larger companies are going to be more represented within the index and the smaller companies are going to be less represented within the index. In fact, roughly 27% of the money you invest when you invest in an S&P 500 index fund is allocated towards the top 10 largest companies of the total 500 companies that make up the index. So there's one major problem with this and it's a problem that almost no one talks about. Weighting the stocks in the index by market cap means that the fund will systematically buy more of and own too much of the overpriced stocks and too little of the underpriced stocks. Meaning that as a company's stock price increases, the market cap weighted indexes will systematically purchase more of that company. And when a company's stock price decreases, the market cap weighted indexes will own less of that company. But the thing with that though, is that stock prices in the short term are based on emotions and liquidity. The true intrinsic value of a business could not possibly fluctuate to the same extent that stock prices do. If you yourself have ever owned stocks and looked at their price on a daily basis, you've probably thought to yourself, wow, the stock market is bipolar. And that's exactly correct. And it's because stock prices are based on emotions that market cap weighted indexes are systematically flawed. Warren Buffett's teacher, Benjamin Graham, had an analogy that he referred to where he likened the stock market to having a bipolar business partner that would come to you every day and offer to buy your share of the business or sell you his at a particular price. The various prices provided by this bipolar Mr. Market business partner of yours were based on his emotions. Sometimes feeling enthusiastic and suggesting very high prices and sometimes feeling scared and depressed and offering very low prices. The point of Benjamin Graham's lesson was to point out that market prices are based on emotion and also that being in business with a bipolar business partner like this was actually a blessing because you're always given these options to either take advantage of or just ignore. So Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett and every other value investor in this world believe that the true value of a business does not fluctuate as much or as dramatically as the market price for a business's stock does. And therefore the emotional swings of the market sometimes create opportunities to buy stocks at bargain prices. And just as true as that is, these same emotional price swings also sometimes cause stocks to be priced much higher than their true intrinsic value. If Warren Buffett and the other value investors of the world are right about their belief that stock prices in the short term are based on emotions, then it means that we can exploit this inefficiency. And this is exactly what Warren Buffett and all the other value investors do. Okay, so how does all this relate to the topic of market cap weighted index funds? Here it is. Any of the 500 stocks within the S&P 500 index fund at any given time could be mispriced higher or lower than their true intrinsic value. We don't need to know specifically which stocks are underpriced or overpriced. As long as we agree that some of them are mispriced, then it means that buying a market cap weighted index fund will guarantee that we're often buying too much of the stocks that are overpriced and too little of the underpriced stocks. Wow. One easy solution to this is to buy an equally weighted index fund. Here's one exchange traded fund that I think is an even better alternative to a market cap weighted index fund. The ETF ticker symbol is RSP. Here's how its performance looks compared to the S&P 500 market cap weighted index fund since its inception in April 2003. The blue line here is for the equally weighted index and the red line is for the market cap weighted index. And here's the same comparison, but this time also accounting for dividends being reinvested. So this exchange traded fund RSP owns the same 500 stocks that make up the 
S&P 500. However, the only difference is that it owns these 500 stocks in equal weighting rather than being weighted by market cap. The fund is rebalanced on a quarterly basis and that's how it's able to maintain its equal weighting. It has an expense ratio of 0.2%, which is compared to the 0.03% expense ratio of the market cap weighted S&P 500 indexes. However, that's still a very low expense ratio by anyone's standards and it's very justifiable based on the additional work and costs required to do the quarterly rebalancing. The total assets under management of this fund are just $19 billion, which is nothing compared to the combined $765 billion of assets under management of the handful of ETFs that track the S&P 500 market cap weighted index. And if you were to include all the mutual funds that track the market cap weighted S&P 500 index as well, it's easily well over a trillion dollars that's invested in this market cap weighted way. This means that what I'm talking about here in this video with you is not widely known to many people. Not many people have caught on to the superiority of equal weighting over market cap weighting. I think one of the reasons it hasn't caught on yet is because some of the smaller stocks within the list of 500 have a lower number of shares traded every day just due to the nature of them being smaller. And so if a portion of the trillion plus dollars that's invested in these market cap weighted index funds were to change over to an equally weighted index fund, at a certain point, it would really become not possible to keep the funds open. And this again would just be due to the lack of share trading volume in the smaller stocks. In the meantime though, this is definitely a much better way than the market cap weighted option. And if we keep it a secret, we'll be able to enjoy the superior results for quite a while still. So shh. All right, now, yes, when we buy into this equally weighted index fund, we would still be buying too much of some overpriced stocks and we'd still be buying too little of some of the nicely underpriced stocks. However, we'd also be buying more of some of the nicely underpriced stocks than we would be with the market cap weighted index fund. And at the same time, we'd be purchasing less of some of the overpriced stocks. So while yes, this strategy wouldn't allow us to completely avoid buying overpriced stocks, the pricing mistakes that are made would be both sometimes detrimental but also sometimes beneficial. And they should ultimately offset each other and cancel each other out. This is much, much better than the market cap weighted index funds that systematically buy more of the overpriced stocks and less of the bargain priced stocks. So all of this in combination with buying a consistent dollar amount on a regular basis, like bi-weekly or monthly, is how I believe that the passive set and forget investor can achieve the best results in the safest and most diversified way. And this is exactly what I would recommend to even my best friend or family members that that are looking to invest in the passive set and forget way. If you have a large lump sum of money to invest in this way, you shouldn't invest it all at once. You should instead spread out investing it over maybe a 12 month period. And if you don't have money to invest, but you're ready to start, then you can just make a declaration yourself that you're gonna start using a fixed percentage of every paycheck that you receive for investing and then just start immediately. And if it's your first time here, consider subscribing. I make videos on investing for beginners and really I just put out the content that I wish I had when I was first starting out. Also a quick reminder, I'm not a financial advisor, so please don't take my content as financial advice. I'm just someone who loves investing and has spent a lot of time learning about it and thinking about it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.